So this is the problem. Basically, around 2004 or so, computers stopped getting any faster. Because this continues to be true, now what they can do is they can keep on cramming more and more cores into the same amount of space. So we started seeing dual core laptops and quad core laptops and GPUs and so forth. <clears throat> but the reason why this flattening happened was physics, was thermodynamics. This is a plot of the energy dissipation of a CPU as a function of time uh, in terms of, of watts per square centimeter, the, the amount of heat that a CPU dissipates. And a few common, common items are, are noted uh, along that plot. So right around 1998, a CPU was basically about as hot as a stove. Right around 2004, they were becoming on the order, or on the order of the, the heat densities of nuclear reactors. And by 2008, they were reaching the heat dissipation needs of the surfaces of a, of a rocket engine. Basically, that, when they hit that limit, they had to stop making them any faster because we, we simply don't know how to manufacture materials that can sustain that, those temperatures. They, anything we make will melt at those temperatures. That's why on a modern CPU, if the fan fails, the CPU has about a second to, to shut itself off before it, it damages itself. One second. If the fan that, that is attached to a CPU isn't actually blowing, if something damages the fan, CPUs have thermal fuses internally that will shut, try to shut them out instantly. Because within, within less than one second, this will actually cause physical damage to the circuits. And they're packed so close together that, that they'll, they'll, they'll just melt out, basically. So this was the end of the free lunch. For many, many years, when I was doing my PhD, I started my PhD before this. And we were still operating in the mode, well, Code too slow, who cares? Do something else and wait two years. The next generation of computers will be faster, and you'll just run it again, and, and it'll be done. That's just gone. Now they're giving us multi-core chips. They're giving us GPUs, clusters, clouds, et cetera, et cetera. We basically are being forced to look into using parallel resources, whether we like it or not. Because waiting for the machines to get any faster is just not going to happen. And there's no solution in sight. No one has come up with anything, even since these slides were actually from the mid-2000s, and in the intervening eight years or so, since some of this, I mean, this one had uh, numbers out to eight, but, but these discussions along these lines started around in the early 2000s, and uh, since, nothing, nothing of use has happened. So we talked already about um, <coughs> we talked already about um, sort of the, the complexity of an algorithm. And be, but before, before we start looking at using clusters and seeing, and seeing where we can put our codes, there's one important piece of the puzzle that you do need to, to understand. And so I want you guys to try for a couple of minutes a short little exercise, which is the following. To derive and plot what is known as Amdahl's law. So Amdahl's law is an upper bound on the speed up that you can achieve when you parallelize a, uh, a code, OK? So you want to ask yourself, OK, if I had, imagine that, a, that, that you're writing a code, and the total time it takes, if this is the total amount of time running your code takes, there's a certain fraction s of that time which you can't parallelize at all. Right? You, you simply can't parallelize that, because maybe it includes reading an input file that you only have that, uh, that you ha only have access to on one machine, or opening a database connection, or computing some quantity that has to be done in a way that you don't know how to parallelize. And then the rest of the time, 1 minus s, right, this fraction of the time, you can spread out to all machines. So what, you, what, you want to, what I want you guys to ask is find and imagine you have p processors total. So you're, this fraction. You're going to run this on a computer that has p processors total, and you want to ask, how fast can, I, can it go? So the total runtime on one computer will be basically the sum of these two, right? So it'll be 1, scaled out to 1. And now imagine it would run on p processors, and that you would do the job perfectly, right? You would parallelize the job perfectly. How much faster can you make it as a function of p? It'll take you just a couple of minutes. Think about it for a second. And, and if you can write a little Python function to plot it, and we'll see the solution in a minute. Yes? S has to happen first. Excuse me? No, 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 no. no. The, and in fact, in practice, in practice, they're, they're actually, it's an aggregate, right? I mean, in practice, what happens is you have a little bit of serial work. You have a little bit of parallel work, serial, parallel, serial, parallel. But this is the aggregate count. So the cumulative fractions of serializable part and 
and parallelizable part. And imagine the parallelizable part parallelizes perfectly. That basically it goes perfectly to all P machines and there's no overhead of communication. The simplest analysis you can do. Um, think about it for a second and try to plot it and we'll see the solution in a minute. This is kind of a pencil, quick pencil and paper slash plotting exercise. Does anyone have a, fit, a plot? I'll give you guys one more minute and then we'll, we'll have a look at the solution. <clears throat> what you want to plot is basically as a function the potential speed up as a function of the number of P of the number of processors for different values of the serial fraction and see, see sort of how, how it compares. So let's have a quick look at the solution. So if you have, if you have one processor, the time is going to be the sum of these two times, right? So it's going to be one in whatever units it is, one hour. It doesn't matter because we're going to do, make a, do a relative measurement. And if you have P processors, the serial fraction still takes S, right? Because that's the part you can't parallelize by definition. The parallel fraction takes the remainder piece, but that will spread out among P processors, right? So it's that over P, and then the, to the total speed up that you can do is this. 
which is always less than the inverse of s. You can show very simply that this is always, always less than 1 over s. So the serial fraction basically is a really hard limit. And you would be surprised at what it looks like. So a little bit of, here's a little bit of code. I'll put these slides up later. So here's a little bit of code to plot it. But let's have a quick look at the plot. If your serial fraction is a half, if you can only parallelize half of your code, look at what happens as you add. And this is a logarithmic plot. So I'm here, I'm scaling the number of CPUs as powers of 2, not linearly, right? And very, very, very quickly, this curve flattened out completely, right? Basically, at, from this point onwards, adding processor doesn't give you anything because you, you top out very rapidly. Now, the upper curve is a serial fraction of just 5%. So 95% of your code parallelizes really well. And still, it shows you that the maximum speed up you can get is a factor of 20. And you get that with 2 to the 10 processors, which is a huge amount. So basically, understanding how your code parallelizes is very important because it tells you what does it, ultimately, this is the resource you pay for, right? Somewhere, in some way, throwing more CPUs at the problem is going to cost you or your advisor or somebody money and resources, right? So is it worth paying for it or not? So before you say, I'm going to run this on 10,000 nodes, right? Stop and wait a second and try to understand, does it make sense or not? Maybe it does. Maybe you are in a situation where the problem really is ridiculously parallelizable, and each chunk of analysis takes such a long time, and the startup cost is so negligible that it does make sense to run down 10,000 nodes. But before you do that, at least try to understand what, what situation you're in, because this, the properties of this analysis, of this completely trivial five minutes worth of napkin math, uh, shows you that it's very easy to waste money when parallelizing code. So. <clears throat> Kathy Yellick from um, EX here on campus, very, who's one of the persons who has done the most thinking about parallel computing in the world, has a very nice summary of sort of what are the key issues that you have to keep in mind when you think about parallelizing code. First is finding enough of it because of what we just said. You, you, second, understanding what is the granularity of, of your work, right? What are the pieces that you chunk up? and you send out the parallel resources. And that is completely, none of, these are just guidelines and things for you to keep in mind. None of this, this is really much more art than science. <coughs> because you want small chunks so that you can optimize the use of many resources, but they have to be big enough to hide the overhead of setup and communication and whatnot. So it's always a balancing act. Locality, locality means that typically, you have memory and, and, and access to data, which is fast, but tends to be limited in size, and larger pools of data that, are, that have more data, but are typically slow. The classic example of that is, in, in, even in your computer, your cache, your, your CPU has a little bit of memory built into it internally that you can't even access explicitly, which is extremely fast. It's right next to the CPU. It's extraordinarily fast, but it's very, very small. And the processor actually manages it. Then you have your own, the, the memory on the computer that you have maybe two or four gigs on a modern laptop, which you can access. And then you have your hard drive, which is itself maybe a few hundred gigabytes, right? But it's much, much slower, right? And you always have to think of this when you do parallel computing. Uh, basically, where is the data? And you basically need to bring the computing closer to the data because moving data from memory is very expensive. And, we're gonna, and in the cloud, the same exact thing happens. You always have to worry about putting the, compute, the computational resources close to where the data is because typically data transfer times will dominate anything you try to do. Um, you have to uh, find ways of balancing the loads. If you're spreading out computations and not all of them take the same time, you have to worry about how do I balance the load so that I don't have, a th I'm paying for 1,000 nodes, and in reality, one of those 1,000 is working and the other 999 are doing absolutely nothing. Guess what? You're still paying for all 1,000 of them, all right? Um, communi coordination and communication. Often, communication is the most expensive part of solving a problem, but obviously, Getting the wrong answer very fast is not enough. So, um, and very importantly, you, whenever you start optimizing parallel code, you have to measure. Your intuition is really, really never going to be very useful when doing parallel computing. Um, optimizing serial codes by, by eyeballing where the, where the slow parts are is a bad idea already. In a parallel scenario, forget it. It's not even worth trying because, because the, the realities of how communication 
and, uh, and computational overlap are so hard to eyeball intuitively in anything but the most trivial cases that you really, you have to try to, me to basically measure it before you, you do anything. So for those of you interested, there's a very nice, I'm not going to spend time on this, article called The Landscape of Parallel Computing Research, a view from Berkeley, that if you're interested in this topic, you should read it. It's a white paper that was written a few years ago from, by Berkeley. And they sort of analyze what are the main mathematical ideas that are parallelizable and the main classes of algorithms that are sort of generic ideas across scientific computing that are parallelizable. Um, so what about Python? Well. We have multiple implementations in Python of the virtual machine, and Python has threads, but we're going to focus on CPython, which is the one that you're using. And the, the take-home message when we're working in Python is that even though threads are supported in Python, for you guys, there are very limited use. Because Python has something called the Global Interpreter Lock, the GIL, the G-I-L, which means that only one thread at a time can modify Python data structures. So you can have 10 threads or say four threads on your CPU running, but only one of them is actually able to modify anything visible in Python. So you would ask, well, why the hell are, there are the threads in there for? If, they, if only one of them can run at a time, it's kind of silly to have them, right? Can somebody think of a good reason where they are useful, even though only one of them can modify Python visible data structures at a given time? The problem, that's perfectly correct. The problem is that they have to make their own data not in Python. Oh, I see. Because the, only one of them is allowed to execute any Python at all. That's the problem. So can anyone think of a scenario where they are useful? When you're waiting for data coming from somewhere else. So if you start threads that are waiting for data to come from the network, for example, they work very well. Because those libraries have been written so that once they start, the buffer in which they store the network data is invisible to Python until some other operation has been done. But in the meantime, they can continue receiving data. So you could imagine writing a, a web, web crawling uh, process that uses four or even eight threads, which basically spawns 10 connections using 10 threads to different servers and waits for the data to come back. And because there's so little CPU involved, Python will switch the threads one at a time, and as they get data in, it'll be aggregated. But they will all be doing the, in the background, they will be buffering the data. Okay? So that's about the only scenario where threads are useful in Python. Maybe I missed this. Why is there a global interpreter lock? That's a, that's a pretty crippling handicap for this approach to parallelism. Why was that done? It's, the reason is simpli um, simplicity of implementation. People have tried to remove the gil from Python, from C Python. And they have succeeded in removing it, but at a price of a major slowdown of all serial operations. Removing the gil, a gil is extremely complicated. Java doesn't have it. The implementation of Python running on Java doesn't have the gil. And that, but that's because the Java virtual machine, Sun invested probably billions of dollars paying people to find ways of locking in an extraordinarily complicated way all throughout the Java virtual machine so that instead of one big lock, there's locks for every data structure everywhere. And so that these locks these locks are acquired and released over time as threads are switched and they protect different pieces of the interpreter without having a single one to protect the whole thing. But that is a very, very, very complicated thing to do and it took years for Java to get there with hundreds of engineers. Nobody has had the resources to, the, to do that for Python. And people who have tried with limited resources have always failed. They've been able to make it work, but so catastrophically, with such catastrophic performance for the normal case that people simply say, we're not willing to do that. So the solution is to, <coughs> uh, you can do um, in-process parallelism in Python, but as, I, as we said, you have to mine the gil. You can uh, use libraries that are threaded themselves and do data parallelism. For example, NumPy or SAPEC can be compiled against the threaded version of, of uh, Atlas. Um, there's a library that I'm going to mention, NumiXPR, briefly, which is like a NumPy VM. It's a little, very elegant hack just for NumPy expressions, but that can actually work very well. There's a library called Fiano that I'm not going to go into, but if you guys are interested, if you have a CS background, you may want to look into it. It's a very interesting project out of a machine learning lab in Canada. Um, and then there are GPU solutions that uh, <coughs> Paul is going to mention later. And finally, you can write your own threaded code, and you can do what you were suggesting, which is basically write a bunch of threads, do your work over there, and then come back to Python. But the problem is you have to do all that code in pure C by hand with Python not seeing it. So it's, it gets really cumbersome and complex. Or you work in multiple processes, where so because now you're using multiple versions of Python, then it doesn't matter. Each one of them has a gil, and you send messages and data back and forth. And uh, 
Python has two modules, multiprocessing, which is built into Python itself since Python 2.6, and a new one in Python 3.2 called Futures, which is a little bit higher level. Uh, I mentioned it so you know about it, but it's, it won't matter for you for now. Um, there are other external libraries, and we're going to see what IPython offers here. I'm obviously biased. We wrote IPython, but we think it's, it, does, it does a good job. Multiprocessing is built into the language. <coughs> the calling syntax follows very closely that of the threading module, but it uses processes instead of threads. The idea being if you, if you were doing something with, with threads, or you knew how to do something with threads, or you already used the threads, then it should be easy to switch to multiprocessing. Um, and, and, it, and it does expose a number of useful things. It exposes the concept of a process, and a process is simply something that you give it, you give it a function as a target, you call start, it, goes, it starts running, and at the end you call join to wait for it to finish. And so you can start in a loop, multi, you, ha you can have a pool of these things, and you can pass them functions to, to execute. Um, and uh, and the, 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 the documentation for it is fairly good, so I, I just want to point it to you guys, and then in the homework you'll have a chance to play with it a little bit. Um, with NumPy, it's important to mention what do you get with NumPy. Out of the box, not a whole lot. Um, you can link uh, NumPy and SciPy against the multi-threaded Atlas or against the, math, uh, the Intel math kernel library, which is itself multi-threaded. Those of you running um, NThought EPD are using that because EPD ships with a version of NumPy and SciPy that are, that are compiled against Intel MKL. So at least a lot of the linear algebra will be done in parallel if you have a dual core laptop or a quad core laptop. The linear algebra parts will be done in parallel. But that's about it. Beyond that, you can write manual OpenMP, C, and Fortran threaded code. It can be done. Ugh, it's a pain. Um, it really is a pain. Uh, NumiXPR is a nice expression compiler for NumPy. It's something which takes expression, NumPy expressions and chunks them up very, very carefully, analyzes how to chunk them up, and then sends them to multiple threads. It uses less temporary data structures, and it can be uh, very cache friendly. The way to use NumiXPR is fairly simple. You import it, it's just a Python library, and then you can say evaluate and you give it in parentheses expressions and this is this has the same effect as doing a plus one uh, but it will do it behind the scenes for you using its own machinery uh, so if you find yourself writing a code and somewhere you have an expression that is your bottleneck and it's just a bunch of numpy algebra this may be worth looking into because it's so easy to use you basically switch you change your code from writing it like this to calling evaluate quotes and that's it. And otherwise, the code remains the same. And it can, it can actually, for example, you can control how many threads it uses. So in this case, um, the original expression was using, um, was taking 36 milliseconds. And with four threads on this machine, it took uh, four milliseconds, a speed up of, of a factor of eight. The reason why the speed up is actually greater than the number of cores used is because not only is NAMI XPR using all the cores, it's also using them more efficiently. Um, it, it's not creating their NumPy when it does this creates a bunch of internal intermediate temporaries So when NumPy evaluates this expression it does a times B Stores that then multiplies that times two stores that then it does B squared stores that somewhere Then it adds that in this other thing and stores the result of that Then it does a squared and stores that and then it adds these two to give you the final answer. So there's like six temporary arrays that are created evaluating this by NumPy. And those are avoided by NumiXPR. Yes, question? Are there situations where you wouldn't want to use NumiXPR? Yeah. I mean, if it's fast enough. If NumPy by, it's still. Like, why wasn't NumPy implemented this way? Well, ah, because you're forced to writing your code inside of strings, okay. right? We don't have access in Python Python is not Lisp in a way. We don't have access to enough of the compiler machinery to transform how large expressions like this are evaluated. So a library can't do that in NumPy. It can be done in C++ with template li expression template libraries such as Blitz. It can't be done in Python by default. It forces you to write your code like this inside of strings. That's the main reason why it wasn't. But people are beginning to, to play with the idea of making an extension to NumPy such that you could write code like this and, and then what it would return would not be an array, but effectively a delayed version of this. And at some point you would do something, let's say you call this thing C. 
And so at some point later when you need it, you do c.compute or c.evaluate. And then it would trigger the actual computation so that it could store these trees of expressions and understand them better in ways that, are, that it can't in the normal way. So people are looking into that actually. And, and I, I think there's a good chance in the next few years we're going to see more work going in this direction. And IPython, what we try to do is to make it possible to do to parallelize your codes, retaining the interactive feel of IPython, of being able to, to type some code, to send data to your engines, to make them do some operation, to get data back from them. And we think that the APIs <coughs> are succeeding in that regard. We, we, would like, we would like the easy things to be basically very straightforward and still give you enough rope to do complicated things um, possible. And importantly, we want to make the process of doing parallel computing be possible to do in a, in a collaborative manner so that you can work with other people on large-scale problems. And we're going to see a little bit later how we, how we achieve that. It, it, it's basically an interplay of these APIs along with the notebook. Um, we have a very dynamic model for load balancing that makes it fairly easy to effectively do automatic load balancing in many codes. Um, it, IPython, by its nature, will integrate with other tools. And, but importantly, it will integrate with existing threads and MPI libraries so that it's possible to run an IPython cluster to do, and do parts of the coordination of the execution of your code with IPython while your engines themselves run MPI code. Because you may have a piece of your code which is done by MPI. So the basic architecture is that instead of now running a single version of IPython that you type code into, you run N versions of IPython that are all behind what's called an IPython controller. And so this group of IPython controller plus IPython engines, this together is called an IPython cluster. And then you connect to the controller with clients. And more than one client can connect at the same time, which means that you can collaborate with someone else. Two, two people can join into the same cluster and look at the results of a cluster. <coughs> you can connect and disconnect. And as long as you haven't shut down the cluster, that remains there. And so you could imagine starting your cluster, doing some computations from, uh, from the office, getting home, reconnecting, querying some data for analysis, letting it run for some more time, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you, how do you use it? We're going we're to see a little bit more of this um, when we move to, to the hands-on work, but I want it at least for reference. On a multi-core machine, uh, whoops, I need to update this, this slide uh, before I upload them. It's, it's actually start. Uh, it's missing the word start right there. So you would say start local, how many, however many engines you want, and it will start a local cluster. Um, you basically don't have to set anything up. You can also start it with MPI, or you can start it with, que with other queuing systems. And in fact, what we have with Star Cluster is that it does something like this. It actually starts it with SunGrid Engine, which is the machinery that Amazon exposes for, for starting, uh, starting clusters. And, uh, and Star Cluster actually basically configures everything for this to happen behind the scenes so that with one command you can get a cluster on Amazon that has been pre-configured. So <coughs> because your laptops are probably at most dual core, a handful of you might have quad core laptops here, but that's probably the most that you have. Um, eventually you might be in a situation where you want more than that. You want 32, 64 nodes. I would say that because of Amdahl's law, don't think of running codes on th thousands or tens of thousands of cores quite yet, okay? Because chances are you don't have a problem that, that will tolerate running in that, in that regime efficiently. But it's very possible that you have a problem where 32 or 64 nodes are completely worth it, right? And 32, 64 nodes, that's the regime where Amazon can be useful. You can start up to 20 instances. I think if you start the largest ones, the, the eight core instances, I think you're limited to eight of them at a time, unless you ask for more. You can actually ask them to raise your cap, but the default cap is eight. But still, that's eight eight core instances, that's 64 nodes. That's a decent amount of CPU power that you can muster basically with, with one command. And the, advantage, the, the beauty of that is that you can start it, have it running the time you need, and then stop it when you're done, and that's it. You didn't have to buy anything. You didn't have to set anything up. You didn't have to um, talk to a sysadmin. You can, you can basically initiate it, run your analysis, and shut it down, and you're done. And actually, for something like that, you may end up paying just a few dollars. I mean, running an analysis uh, on 8-8 core machines, I think they cost on the order of, 
a couple bucks an hour each. So eight of them would be maybe 16 bucks an hour. And let's say that your analysis completes in four to five hours. OK, it might be on the order of having a poster printed. But that's kind of a, that's a reasonable amount of money to pay for an expense for a conference, for example. You run a big analysis before a conference. You, it costs you 60 or 80 bucks. You print your poster, um, and you have it done. What Star Cluster does is it makes it very easy to not have to have to use that web interface that you saw from Amazon already, which is fine and it offers a lot, but it, it makes all the processes very clickety and very annoying. Star Cluster is a library written at MIT that allows you to effectively manage all of that from within your laptop with a configuration file. So once you, you've set things up, you write a config file, and then from your laptop you can uh, start uh, start clusters, stop them, see which ones are there, SSH into them, attach storage, persistent storage volumes to them, et cetera, et cetera. The, the two main pieces that Amazon has, and we're only going to go into the basic computing, are the EC2 stuff that stands for Elastic Compute Cloud, which is basically the starting and stopping of virtual computers on their, on their network, and also the storage which is named EBS, and EBS stands for Elastic Block Storage. These are basically, just like these are virtual computers, these are virtual hard disks. So these are effectively things that are like hard disks that you can attach to an instance and they appear as a directory of your, of your instance. Because by default, these instances contain fairly small hard, the, the virtual hard drives of the computers themselves are fairly limited. And furthermore, <coughs> unless you want to keep them private, you have to, um, if you want to keep them private, you can, but then you have to pay for them all the time that they exist. But if you don't want to pay for the virtual computers when they're not in use, you have to make them public. So what most people do is they put on the virtual computers only the software that they're going to use, right? And then they make that public in case anybody else wants to kind of turn it on with themselves paying for the, for the cost. But your data, you may want to keep in this. And so there's a separate... You, you, you mount this on a separate hard disk, and, and Amazon charges you separately for the storage than they charge you for the actual compute. And Star Cluster makes it very easy to manage both the storage and the compute nodes. There's another kind of storage called S3 that we're not going to go into now. S3 storage doesn't look like a hard disk. These EBS things, they look like a hard disk. They appear in a partition. You format them like a hard disk. You put files in them. They're just like a hard disk. Um, S3 storage is more like a database kind of thing. Um, they have what are called buckets of storage in which you put data into the buckets and you retrieve data from the buckets. Um, the advantage of S3 is that it's cheaper. So for certain applications, it's worth learning how to use it. And a lot of web database kind of things can be done with S3. But uh, for starters, you should, this is, I think, the model that is worth learning for at the beginning because it basically is exactly the same thing that you have in a, in a real computer, which is co not computers and hard disks. And it just happens to be all virtualized into the cloud. Okay? So here are a few, a few resources. And now we're going to start with uh, <coughs> working a little bit with, with Amazon uh, and Star Cluster. So is everyone more or less set up? Okay, so now I'm going to switch to Emacs. Can, can those in the back see my screen? Is that big enough? Is the font, the font large enough for you guys to see in the back? Oh, actually, I just realized that. They're, they're filming these on video, but they're using a really low resolution, uh, 480. So I'm going to actually make the font a little bit larger for the sake of anyone who might be watching this later on. And this might still not be large enough, but I don't want to make it absurdly big. Um, so, ah. So here's what, here's what you're, um, is everyone, did everyone uh, successfully do both setting up Amazon and setting up Star Cluster? Because we are going to use both. Okay, so I'm assuming you already have your AWS info <coughs> filled up. 
as in here, and you have your Amazon SSH key also filled in. So this is what, this is what your config file would, would look like once you're done. I've removed from here so that, they're, they end up, so that my private Amazon key doesn't end up on, on a webcast on YouTube. Uh, so I've, I've basically made a copy of my file, of my actual config file with, with this part removed. So you should have these three fields. These are the only three fields. These are the, well, these are the main three fields that have secret information. And then you have to also give the path to your SSH key. And once you have done that, then you define your clusters. So the way EC2 works is it has a notion of a cluster template, which is basically a description of how you want to start your cluster. And I'm going to go through the fields of this cluster of this configuration. And then templates can, each template has a name, and templates can extend other templates and replace fields in them. And so let's have a quick look at the default cluster template that I have in here is called small cluster. Each template has a name. It's this field right here. You have to tell it which key to use. You may want to authenticate with different keys for some reason to Amazon, so each cluster can have a different key. You ask how many EC2 nodes do you want to start in the cluster. You, you ask <coughs> to create a specific user in the cluster. This, it's a good idea to leave, leave this alone because um, SunGrid Engine actually does certain things with this user um, by default to bring all the machines up, so I wouldn't modify that. You can specify the shell if you want. This is a very important field, the Amazon image that you want to use. Um, and AMI, AMI, I think, stands for Amazon Machine Image, and it's basically a copy of the virtual hard drive of the computer that is going to boot. And there is a listing of Amazon images that you can go and see if we go to the console. If we go to the EC2 console, oh, I have to sign in. Da, 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 da. So this is the Amazon console, and their fonts are such that you can't actually read anything, but so be it. Uh, here's the EC2 tab. So here, it gives me a summary of what I have running, how many elastic IPs I have, how many volumes I have active, et cetera, et cetera. Elastic IPs are fixed numeric IP addresses that you can attach with your Amazon instances. Because when you have an instance running, if I click here on running instances, it'll show me which instances I have. I started a cluster with one master node and four slave nodes, four worker, worker nodes, all of them on the micro instance. And if I click on one of them, Amazon will tell me where it's running. This is the URL where, it's, where it runs, which is always kind of a wonky looking URL like that from, that, that always ends in AmazonAWS.com. But you can ask them to give you a permanent IP address, and you can even then configure DNS to have a name associated with it. So this is how many companies actually run. Their web servers, they don't have web servers. They run them on Amazon. They associate an IP address. They register a name for the company. They point it to that IP address, and they're done. They have basically a virtual data center in the cloud. And so if you want to give people a slightly more persistent uh, IP address than these funky auto-generated ones, you can request, uh, you can request uh, what's called an elastic IP address. I haven't done that. And here, in images, you can see a listing of public images. So in this case, it's showing me which AMIs I own. I don't own any. I've been using publicly created ones, but you can see if I ask for all images, it'll take a while. Da, 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 da. <coughs> I didn't remember it taking that long. There we go. 
So this is a, a long listing of all of the images that are available. So these are all of the images that are available on Amazon that people have made public. And you can create, you can search this, this list or somebody could give you an Amazon instance. So once you have one of these with this name, this is the name that you put into the config or somebody can get, tell you use the specific instance, that basically says boot that computer and each of these was created with some set of libraries pre-included. So the, the author of Star Cluster actually bundles Amazon images that have Star Cluster pre-installed and that have all of the standard Python libraries for scientific computing already baked into them. So basically you don't have to do that yourself, you can use one of Justin's AM, um, AMIs and then that will boot up instantaneously with all of the um, with all of your all of the standard libraries uh, for um, for scientific computing. So what I have done here, so I want to show you guys. So this is what the node image field means. I think this one is uh, is the default star cluster image. Yes, he has them here in 32 bit and 64 bit. Uh, these are the default 32 and 64 bit star cluster images. The 899 is the 32-bit one, and the 999 is the 64-bit one. And here is where you choose the instance type. They have a table that explains what these are. Where the rough equivalent, this is roughly equivalent to a computer with this much RAM and this much hard disk and this much CPU and so on and so forth. So the T1 micro is the one that you get for free. So for one year after opening your account, you get, to, you get the equivalent allotment. You get 750 hours a month off T1 Micro, which is equivalent to a fairly small laptop. It's actually 600 megs of RAM, not much CPU, so it's kind of like a netbook, but you get it for free. You can run it 24-7. You can run 750 hours per month of this for free, and they won't charge you. Yes? The default of this was M1 small. Yes, those, those you pay for. Yes? <laughs> Uh, you might, yeah. If you're running, if you're running the other one, you might end up with the bill. If you did it since today, um, probably a dollar, maybe. Um, so T1 Micro, I, I'm sorry about that, guys. I should have announced. Why doesn't a Star Cluster start with T1 Micro as the default? Then? It just wasn't in the Star Cluster starting. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. We can suggest that they that they actually start with the T1 Micro. Most people just think. It doesn't matter. They charge the moment it starts up. That's it. Amazon doesn't charge for CPU. They don't measure CPU utilization. They measure the time they're up. So, so I, I was going to mention it, but but might as well mention it now. So stopping allows you to restart quicker. But they charge you for the time that a stopped instance. They charge you less than running, but they charge you a small amount for having the instance kind of nearby. Whereas terminating it means they delete those temporary files, but the next time you start it, it may take a few minutes longer. Okay. So it's a difference between taking maybe five minutes or ten minutes to start versus taking one or two minutes. So if you're trying, basically stopping is what you use if you want to reboot the computer, right? Whereas terminate is what you use if you're not, not going to use it. But even for even if you're not going to use it for 24 hours, you might want to terminate it because the extra overhead is minutes. It's not like when you've terminated it, it takes a half hour to restart. Okay, it's a matter of minutes. So I do apologize for that. I didn't realize that the default in this file wasn't micro. I guess I had edited mine so long ago that I hadn't, I, I just had forgotten that the default wasn't micro. So if, um, hopefully nobody will end up with a bill from Amazon then of more than a few cents, I think, maybe up to a dollar. So hopefully it won't be a huge deal for you guys. Because, uh, I mean, we can look into their, uh, actually, I'm, now I'm curious what they're pricing. Um, <laughs> I've seen it. I just don't remember exactly what the EC2 pricing is. But let's answer that question. So on-demand instances, which one is it that he had? The um, small, right? So the small default is $0.08 cents per hour, OK? So you've been paying eight cents per hour <coughs> of usage. What? What's that? <laughs> well, it says micro here. It's two cents per hour. And is it an hour blocks? Or is it prorated? Excuse me? Is it an hour 
In hour blocks, yes. Yes, it's in hour blocks. Is that per node? <coughs> per node. So if I take 1,000 nodes. But they wouldn't start. You can only start 20. The default is two nodes. So in that case, yes. Yeah. So in that case, it would be 16 cents per hour. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah, I th Amazon, I think, has a has a console for 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 that, but but uh, but I don't I don't think that Star Cluster tracks that information. You can choose what's called the availability zone, <coughs> and you you really only need to do this if you're worrying a lot about data transfer from and to a specific location. Uh, for normal use, using their default is fine. AMIs live within a region, so they're only available in one region. And the East Coast US one has more AMIs available. But if you need, for example, if you're running a business or if you're going to actually upload large amounts of data, you may actually want to say, I want to start in the Northern California zone because my data is actually on campus on a server and I really want the lowest network latency to the Amazon data center. So I want the data center which is geographically closest to me. And so you, have, you don't have a control over the specific location where it runs, but you're basically targeting parts of the world. <coughs> and a question? Yeah, so the, I mean, just by the instance that this is by just like the number of nodes, for instance, so like M1 small is one node, M1 small node, for instance, and the default that you're setting above is the number of instances where you're just talking about. It's the number of instances, but some of those instances are actually uh, multi-core instances. But that, but that, Um, no, the, the, the multi-core ones are these. The medium and extra large, high CPU, and cluster compute. I think, uh, no, I think actually these are the only ones that are, that are multi-core, that are considered multi-core. So for example, if you start these extra large ones, start cl these are eight core machines. So you pay only for one instance, but start cluster will start eight, eight IPython engines on it because it knows it's an eight core machine and so uh, for example the well actually the example that I'm going to the non-trivial example that we're going to go over now is an example which was run using four of these so we ran it using four of these which gave us 32 nodes for the computation but we were paying 2.4 dollars per <coughs> times four exactly what's that <laughs> uh, yes. Do you think that's a fair reflection of the work being done by the two parts? They run pretty fair every day, though. You can also choose, this is where you, can, you choose the, your EBS volumes. So once you've configured your volumes, you give them a name. These are your hard disks. And then here you can tell it. We, uh, you can tell it which volumes you want to use. <clears throat> and finally, importantly for us, plugins. So in here, we define what plugins we want to use. And later, and, and now I'm going to show you how the plugins are configured. So my default one, I didn't define any plugins. But here, I have. Um, Here. Uh, no, I do have. So in plugins, I said I want the IP cluster plugin. So the IP cluster plugin is the plugin that basically starts IPython with all of the parallel machinery running on it. Uh, let me give you a sense, first of all, of what IP cluster does locally. If you run IP cluster dash, dash, dash help, we give you some information on how to start it and so on and so forth. Our disk is slow. IPython. Yes, it should. So IP cluster is a command that will start the IPython cluster. And 
it has subcommands such as start and stop. Um, oops. So this is how you say start with four nodes, for example. IP cluster start dash dash n equals four. That will start a cluster with four nodes. And this is what it looks like, start dash n four. So there, IPython started a cluster with four, no, with four engines on my local machine. So you can do that locally. What the plugin on, on Star Cluster does is it actually configures that for you and configures port traffic and, and, and HTTP traffic and whatnot so that you can not only run, not only do you, all of your nodes come up as a cluster, but they also come up pre-configured to be accessed from the outside. So it simplifies things quite a bit. But you can do this locally, which means that you can actually debug your codes using IP cluster on your own computer and only run up on Amazon when you need to run, when you say you want to scale beyond what your machine can do. OK? So just to check, we're supposed to be changing our uh, config file to match the system, right? Um, yes, I would suggest that you, that, that, you put, that you put the IP cluster plugin. And then we're going to see, so here I have When you define a cluster, you can actually base a cluster configuration on another cluster configuration. So you can say, for example, I want a cluster which is just like this other one, but changing the AMI, or changing the number of nodes, or whatever. You can change basically only, only the parameters that you wish to change. <clears throat> so here, I was toying with, um, I don't remember what, the, what this AMI was for. I, I, I think Justin and I were playing with something. Um, and in this case, I wanted the cluster size of one. I just wanted to start the node because I was just testing the connections. I didn't, want, I didn't even want uh, any more engines. Um, and in particular, this is an interesting one that uh, <coughs> I want to show you guys. So you don't have to, so I, now I want to show you a non-trivial example. And hopefully the demo will work on micro instances. And we'll see how it works because I want to show you a non-trivial example of using the APIs to motivate that you can do sort of interesting science with this stuff. And then later, we'll come back and we'll see a little bit of the basic building blocks. My experience has been that if when we demo just the, the bottom level API and this is how each function works, people get a little bit bored. So hopefully looking at a, at a, at a kind of scientifically interesting example will be a little bit more um, more engaging. And then we can go back and look at the basic pieces. And I will upload all the notebooks that have um, that have the tutorial, the, p the, the piece by piece tutorial material. I will up upload them for you. But you this, file. excuse me. You upload file sure, sure. I will upload my config file as well. So what does this? Uh, oh, let me let me show you one more thing, which is what a session looks like. Because it could, it can take some time. I started the cluster in advance from my office. And what I did was I, I just copied the shell content to here. I didn't know how long it was going to take. Sometimes when these haven't been started recently, it takes five or 10 minutes while Amazon kind of wakes up. And I didn't want to potentially wait for all that. So this is a copy paste from my terminal about two hours ago when I started this. So I said, start. I, I, you give it which template you want to use in this case, I want to use this chime template. Let me uh, show you again what this chime template is. So it's this template that says, I want to take my small cluster configuration, but I want to change AMIs. I want, in this case, five nodes. So I want one master and four engines. I want to do it with the micro instance, and I want the IP cluster to be configured. Oh, and one more thing that I forgot. This is where you configure the, the plugin. So when you configure the plugin, you should at least put these three lines. You give it which class, which setup class to use. You tell it whether you want the notebook to come up by default or not. I would say it's a good idea to have it come up. It makes life a lot simpler. And then you give it a password for the notebook. So here, <coughs> you guys, I'll give you the URL in a minute. And you can log in to mine as well if you want to. So you, this is how you can collaborate with a colleague. You can start a plug. You can start the cluster, and then two people can log in if they have the password. So I'm going to. So the password is this. Uh, I Python, and it's case sensitive. So it's ipython dash demo dash 2012, and I'll give you the URL <coughs> the, for the where this is running in a minute. So once you start it, 
you say this name right here is this name right here. This name chime here is this name here. Each cluster template has a name. So you're saying start with the template chime. And I, you name this particular instance of that cluster. The reason why you name it is because you can start with the same configuration more than once. You might want to start the same set, conf the same config of this, with the same cluster machinery two or three times in a row. Maybe you want to start it twice because you want to test one thing with your algorithm while you, the part that you know works runs in production with another data set, but you want to tweak something. You may want to start the exact, the exact same one more than once. So each time you start it, you give it a name. And once you give it that information, star cluster goes to work. It begins giving you lots of info. It launches things. It creates security groups. It configures SSH. It configures NFS, da 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 da. It does a fair amount of work for you. It really, it really does a lot for you. And then it says, oh, you wanted the cluster. So now it starts running the IP cluster. Um, it, it detects that you wanted four engines. So it starts it. And then it says, ah, you also wanted the, the web notebook. It creates an SSL certificate for you. It really does a lot. Basically, it, half of the Amazon tutorials are bundled into this command, and half of our own IPython tutorials are, are bundled into this one command, where, where with three lines of config, star cluster does everything for you. And once it finishes, it tells you where it's running. So the notebook URL is this. So if you guys go to this URL with Chrome or a newish Firefox or Safari, you should, be a, you should get a login screen. And that login screen, you can log in with the password that I just gave you, ipython-demo-2012. Yeah, go ahead. I started that one. We'll, we'll destroy it when we're done. Um, I'm going to leave that up there for a second so that you guys, and let me know if you can log in. Or if you can't, it, it, you'll get a warning about a certificate. Since these, these are auto-generated self-signed certificates. Your browser will give you a warning, so tell it to go ahead. I should have gotten an elastic IP for this. And, uh, uh, yes. Is anyone having problems logging in? It worked? OK, good. Which browser are you using? Oh, you know what? You're right. Safari has a weird WebSocket problem that uh, I don't know how to work around. Okay, do you have Chrome or Firefox? No? Hmm. Yes, yeah, Safari, it's a, I, uh, yes, but it won't work. Yes, it's, it's a bug in Safari with WebSockets. Yes, unfortunately, Safari, you're right. Safari, I had seen this problem. I said it used to work, and recent updates to Safari broke something in their WebSockets, how they manage WebSockets, and it doesn't actually work. Sorry. So either Chrome or Firefox. <coughs> So once it finishes, it tells you, in this case, the full startup time took almost four minutes. The cluster is ready to use. You can, I can SSH into it now. So I can actually type that and SSH into the cluster. I can restart it using the restart command. I can stop using uh, the stop command. Or I can terminate using the terminate command, which, as we discussed already, stop allows for quicker restarts. But you pay a little bit for the storage of the nodes kind of in frozen mode, versus, uh, for the storage of the AMI in frozen mode versus um, the, uh, the terminate, which actually destroys that and takes a few more minutes to start. So it's your choice. But the, the, total time <coughs> the total time is on the order of, say, five minutes. So using terminate is perfectly reasonable unless you really want to know that you're going to want to restart it in the next few minutes or the next half hour or so. I normally always use terminate, because I'd rather have to wait than forget that I left something stopped, and then two months later come back and realize, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this has been running. I left that thing sitting there for two months, and it's been charging me for no good reason. Is there, is there a way to set up like an auto-fill if you don't have this for, I don't know, I think it's like a week? Not that I know of. 
There may be, uh, not that I know of. I mean, you could you could do it with star cluster. So you could do it as a, as a small. You could put a cron job, because star cluster does give you a fair amount of information. So let me show you how. So I'm going to stop my local, the local, the one on my laptop now. There is. Okay. So, I don't know. But star cluster has a list. But this would be, to, what he's asking for is to terminate if, the, if they're not even running. Just for having the instances stopped but terminated. Yeah, but, or, or ah. I, okay. Oh, if it's not running for a while. Okay. So here, when you type list clusters, it knows when it was launched, and it knows which instance you have and, and, and all of that. So I imagine you could write a little cron job using the star cluster APIs that basically once a day monitors. And if it detects that the stop time is more than, say, a week ago, then issues the terminate command. So it would be pretty easy to write that with using star cluster. And since star cluster, not just calling it, but star cluster is itself a Python package, I'm sure you can make the low level API calls to basically get that data, get the, the timestamp as a date time object. You do today, you do a diff. If that diff is greater than seven days, you, you issue the terminate command. So it would probably be a half hour's worth of, of star cluster exercise to write that and put it in your cron as a cron job. On, on a machine that, that is always running. OK, so this is the information that you get from Star Cluster. With list clusters, it tells you um, where they're running, their, um, including, including their URL. So if I didn't know, if I didn't know that, that URL, I could always get it from here. And by default, the notebook is always running on port 8888. That's where it starts. You can change that, but that's the default where it starts. So everybody should have. This um, visible, is that right? So I want to show you guys, I want to walk you through this as our first kind of hands-on demo, which is, and we'll see if this works. And this is kind of an interesting little story that happened last week. So last week, I went to Colorado to, I had to give a couple of talks, and I had to attend a workshop on genomics in the cloud. The NIH was organizing a workshop about doing genomics in, genomics in the cloud. Who here is in the bioinformatics, genomics, biology field? Any of you? You are? OK. So we have one person in the room who actually understands this. Not me, uh, because I'm not a genomicist. I'm a physicist by training. But me and Reagan Kelly, one of the authors of IPython and myself, were invited to participate in this workshop. And one of the things we were going to do was on Wednesday, on Tuesday afternoon, we were scheduled to give a demo to the audience of how to use IPython in, with, with Star Cluster to do work in the cloud. And I told the organizer of the workshop, look, I can put together an example. We have some tutorial examples that are kind of toy problems with matrix multiplications and things like that. He said, well, it would be very cool if we had a biologically relevant example for this audience. And I said, yes, that would be very cool, but I have no idea how to do that. However, if you help me, uh, maybe we can come up with something. Um, and so the Friday before, we had a brief discussion where him and uh, an ex-post of uh, postdoc of his who's now at Northern Arizona uh, and Flagstaff uh, came up with an idea and they sketched it out to me and I said if what you're describing is really what the code needs to do I think we can do that okay um, and that was the end of it we just kind of talked about it on Friday then Monday night we sat down in the hotel lobby after the first day of the workshop we sat down and kind of went over the basic ideas we started checking that the AMI was, was working. Justin Riley, the author of Star Cluster, was at MIT over IRC helping us. So he started getting the AMI ready. And we, we sketched out the pseudocode for that. And then we went to bed. That's it. We, we did no actual coding, just an email with a little bit of pseudocode. And then on Tuesday morning at 9 AM, we actually started coding. The demo was meant to be presented on Tuesday at 4.30. And we had basically two people, Min and I, who knew IPython very well and had no clue what the biology code did. We had three biologists who had written the, bio, the, the genomics libraries who had never used IPython or Star Cluster, had never heard of it. Um, and we had the Star Cluster author at MIT um, helping us with the AMIs. And we started all coding because we were, like you are, logged into the notebook. Everybody can edit the same notebook at the same time. 
Now, we don't have Google Docs style real-time synchronization yet. We're working on kind of implementing that, but at least multiple people can edit in the same notebook. The only thing is that if one person is going to make a lot of changes, you have to say, I'm editing. So what we did was we made a few copies. You can ask here, make a copy. So we just made a few copies, and each person would edit different cells, and they would say, okay, this part is ready, and then one person would copy-paste that into the other one. So we effectively, we were merging manually, but it allowed us to basically test it in the real cloud environment and start building the parallel code. And around 2 p.m., all of a sudden, I saw Rob Knight, the organizer of the workshop, and Greg, the Northern Arizona fellow, and they were looking at a plot, and they were very excited. I asked, what's, what's going on? Why, why are you guys so happy? And they said, we think we need to write this up as a paper because this is actually a biologically interesting result. The analysis actually led to a very interesting finding. So they called the editor of the ISME journal, which is one of the nature journals that focuses on microbiology, and asked, can we submit a short three-page commentary um, for, for short review as an outcome of this workshop? And the editor, after they told her the story, was thrilled. And we basically finished the paper yesterday. Now we're just polishing formatting. It should be submitted by the end of today. I had never seen something like that where you start writing code at 9 a.m. and by, 4, by 3 p.m. you're ready basically to, to write up the paper. I'm not saying this is always going to happen, <laughs> but this was, I wish it did, but I know, I, I know better than to know that these things only happen once in a blue moon. But, it, but what, what, what is true is that the tools did enable two teams or three, three different teams who had basically very little overlap in skill set to work together in parallelizing a non-trivial analysis and running it in the cloud. In fact, what we had run at that point ran, would run in about 10 minutes with 32 nodes. Uh, for the real production run for the paper, we, we reran the analysis, and the rerun of the analysis took about 24 hours because we basically made the, made the we scanned a larger set of, of the, a larger part of the parameter space just to make sure that the results were robust, and that took about 24 hours of clock time. So that one was restarted on Wednesday, and it took about until Thursday to finish. But that was about a month's worth of CPU time. We measured how much total CPU was used, and it was an analysis that would have taken a month. So basically, with these tools, we started from scratch on Tuesday. By today, we're basically finished with the paper. And done, if they had tried, even if they had had that idea, and they thought it was a good idea to run it, if they had started to run on, on one machine on Tuesday, they would still be three weeks from even finishing the, the run. Uh, and I think the total cost is going to amount to See, we're running probably a few hundred dollars. So I think we're. I think we had in t the the two the two dollars and forty cent instances. I think the total run was done with uh, five or six of those, and they ran for twenty four hours. So it would be about ten dollars an hour for twenty four hours. So a few hundred dollars. So it's not a trivial amount of money. Well, in this case, we had money from the grant organizing the workshop. We had up to five hundred dollars to spend on on CPU time. But, um, but I don't think a couple hundred dollars is, is an outrageous price to pay for a valuable result that you, can get a, that you can get a paper out of. And considering that once we shut these machines down, that's it. We don't have to administer anything. We don't have to worry about the machine. So yes, you can buy hardware for a couple hundred dollars, but not that much. right? And, ma and administering a large cluster of 64 nodes begins to be enough of a concern that A, it's a, it's a lot of money to buy, B, power dissipation and, and management of a 64 node cluster, cluster begins to take real work. So this, this is a sensible alternative. And so now I'm going to show you guys what um, the actual execution looks like. So in this case, we have four engines available. So this is what, this is what the API looks like. You say, for my Python import parallel, and you make what's called, the, we typically call it RC, a remote client. Uh, it's an object. Uh, if you want to use the IP cluster one, you have to use the pickle packer. This is just a, a little technical detail. This is included in the star cluster documentation. Uh, and then from a client, a client, <coughs> a client is something that has the IDs of the engines, but the client itself doesn't directly let you send code for execution because it doesn't know how you want to execute the code. Do you want to execute the code on one engine, on all of them? There's, broadly speaking, there are two classes of policy for a code execution that you want to have in parallel computing. Either you want to have a chunk of code that needs to go to everybody, or at least a given subset of your engines, or you have a piece of code that needs, that needs executing and you don't care where it runs, you just want the answer to come back. 
those are broadly speaking the two classes of, of uh, execution policies that you have. And so what we do is the client returns objects that are called views, and a view is an object that has a specific policy for execution. So when we say, I want a load balanced view, the view object is now an object that knows how to execute code, but in a load balanced fashion. So what, what that means is that the view in this case has four engines, <coughs> and these four engines, when you give it a job to do, it will give it to the first it finds. And so if you give it 10 jobs to do, it will begin sending them to the four engines, and as they get completed, it will keep them busy, but in a load balanced manner. The other type of view is, a, is what's called a direct view, which is meant for sending code to everybody. And we offer both because in the same session, you may often want to do both. Sometimes you may want to do, oh, I need everybody to load this data set. I need all my engines to initialize by loading these libraries. And once that has been done, then I need in a load balance fashion to run over this data set in little chunks. And so I don't care who does it. I just want all of these jobs to be done. But when they're done, I want to collect the following variable from all of them to do aggregate statistics. So because it's common to need both, IPython offers both objects, so a direct view and a load balance view. So, and, in, and uh, in this case, what we're doing, when you slice the client, what you do is get a view object, which is a direct view. And so this is in one line, getting a direct view and writing to it as a dictionary. So it turns out that view ob direct view objects can be manipulated as a dictionary. So if I say, if I make a direct view from, the, from all of my engines, then I can say direct view and I can r send data to it. So in this case, I sent a variable called tutorial whose value was 10 to all of the engines. And in this case, and by doing this, I retrieved the variable tutorial from all of the engines because I have four engines. I get a list of four numbers, in this case, four copies of the number 10. So <clears throat> this is useful when you've computed the same thing, either because you need to ch send a flag, for example, to all of your engines, or if you've computed something that has different values and now you want to summarize it, you want to do aggregate statistics on this side. <clears throat> so it makes it very, very simple to push and pull data to your engines. And um, in, in our documentation, we have full-length tutorials. But I want, to, I want to show you guys this example, which is sort of a non-trivial one, and, and just explain it bit by bit. So this is simply a little utility to, which is used to simply monitor on to wait on a result that has been sent for execution. So you will see later that when we send results for execution, you can do it in, two, in one of two different ways. You can send a result for execution in what's called blocking mode or non-blocking mode. And this is an important concept of doing work in parallel in general. What is the difference between blocking or synchronous mode versus non-blocking or asynchronous mode? When you do something in blocking mode, what you, do, what you say is, Execute this, and I'm going to sit here and wait until you're done. And when you're done, I want the answer back, OK? And I, I will stop executing my own code until you're finished, because I want the answer to be the real, the actual quantity computer. You can also say, do this and go on, and I will go on doing my own thing. And when I need the answer, I will try to get it. Okay. So IPython allows you to do both, synchronous and asynchronous execution. Sometimes synchronous. Excuse me, synchronous is nicer. When working interactively, synchronous execution is nice because it lets you kind of do something, wait for the answer, and get it back. So it feels a little bit more like the interactive workflow. But if you're going for efficiency, you're often better off doing asynchronous execution because it lets you send large amounts of work to machines and continue doing something in the meantime. Okay? So this is a utility which, on an asynchronous result, tries to sh show you a little bit of progress. And so Asynchronous results have a ready method, which tells you whether they're ready or not. And you can wait on them. So this is a utility that simply waits for a second on them while they're not ready and prints a little bit of output. Okay? So we'll see later that it will be useful, basically, to give us interactive feedback on how things are progressing as we execute things. And by the way, I am not exactly sure how well this is going to go. I'm actually going to remove even a few more 
from this data set because I'm not really sure how well this is going to and it might not be worth the full length I think one is going to be a little bit too long okay so these are so the analysis that we're going to perform is if my understanding of genomics that these guys explained to me is correct uh, an eraser uh, here's an eraser So the problem in question is we have a bunch of genome sequences. So these are sequences like this that consist of the letters A, G, C, T, A, et cetera, et cetera, A, possibly with dashes. And all of these in principle can be aligned to each other with gaps between them. And the question is if I use the entire sequence to reconstruct if I use the entire sequence to try to reconstruct the phylogeny of, um, of, of this, basically where it came from in an evolutionary sense, which I will get one specific tree from the entire sequence <coughs> of where it came from, but I can also try to reconstruct that information with partial data from the sequence, only using a subset of the sequence. And the question is, which parts of the sequence, what is the better strategy? If you're, go if you're going to try to reconstruct the tree with partial data, is it better to do it with as much partial data as you can, or can you get away with smaller amounts of partial data? And it turns out that uh, the obvious intuition was, is, well, if you're, gonna, if you're going to throw away data, the less you throw, the better. So longer subsequences should be better. And the interesting finding was that uh, by, by looking at this, we found out that you can actually get better reconstruction with partial sequences if they are appropriately chosen. It turns out there are certain regions of the sequence that they have identified as having very high variability, and some of those regions turn out to be the most informative ones. And so the analysis was to try to find wh what, what is the effect of subsampling in the tree reconstruction. So what these, what these things tell us are exactly the, the boundaries for these regions, where to start and where to stop reading, think of them as over there, basically for each of these, start here and start, stop here, start here and stop here. So these are the different start and stopping points, and they have names for them. Uh, and I removed the one that said full sequence. So the example that I'm going to show you guys uh, when we run it, and it may not finish, is probably not really very meaningful because I removed the comparison against the full length, um, so it won't it won't actually give anything biologically significant, but the point is to make it run quicker because I didn't want to turn, in the, turn on the large instances and pay for them. And I don't want to run it on the real large instance where this is actually running because we do have the real results running, but because the, the other guys are finishing up the paper and they may, I, I don't want to mess up the results while they're, while they're actually um, uh, running the paper. So, This is how <coughs> this is how you, you start parallelizing a script. So this was the, the part of the, of the code that had to load the data. In this case, it doesn't matter too much what it is. In, in, in each of your problems, the code will look a little bit differently. But we've all had code like this, which is look for a file, um, see if the file exists. If it's already there, skip it. Otherwise call some reading, some library that knows how to read my own data, figure out where the data is, do something to it, and then return the name of the data that I loaded. Uh, it, it doesn't, the specifics don't matter a whole lot. The point is, in order to do this in parallel, what we do is we take this, which would be a typical kind of script that you would run to load a data set, and all you have to do is put it into a function. That's it. Put it in a function. Because the basic API for sending things to execute in your engines and for defining tasks is functions. So this is the line of code that actually does the execution. So what this does is it calls the function load subalignment right here, and it maps it to the sequence files and the region boundaries. So this is map, it maps it in non-blocking mode, 
And the, map, the, the, the syntax of our map functions are exactly the same as the syntax of the built-in map function. So you can say map uh, function to a set of sequences. Map is a built-in of the language. So if you know how to write something using map, you know how to parallelize it with IPython. Because basically what you do is if you have a function and arguments in, in Python, you would do view.map function arguments. And that's it. OK? So it's the, exact, it's the exact same thing, except that we have map. By default, map, whether map is synchronous or asynchronous, depends on whether you have a, a flag called block. out. Whether you have a flag, flag called block, true or false, you can change that state. But if you want to be explicit, you can use map sync or async, which are always explicitly synchronous or explicitly asynchronous, regardless of the value of the, of the, of the flag. So, oops, here. So once we've done this, we have an object called, and here we go. We have an object called AMR, and now I'm running that wait on AMR, which basically tells me what has finished. So it was a good idea to start it and see the. Yeah, it's actually it's actually going to take a while. So we'll see we'll see whether we'll see we'll see how long uh, how long they take to finish. I probably should have started this even earlier. Um, because, I mean, we can we can keep working here. Because the no we are operating on the master node, which is where the notebook is running, right? The engines are over there busy doing their thing. So we could be looking. This is why I was able to run this code right here, because this is waiting and it doesn't matter. Right now, my kernel, the, the notebook is busy because it's giving me this information. But I can always stop. I can always stop this, cur this information right here by, by, sending, by using the stop button, or send, which is or using the menu option, kernel interrupt. And then I stop that so I can continue working. <coughs> <coughs> and, um, and then hopefully they'll, they'll finish soonish. We'll see. I mean, it is, it is making progress, but it is slower than I thought. Oh, here I have. Here's my water. If it doesn't complete, it's not a huge deal. Um, because I can show you what the completed results look like. What I want to show you really is the code and show you that this is really executing in parallel and letting you continuing to do your analysis while the engines are busy. You're, in this case, the, four the poor four engines are busy doing their thing. So here's another little utility to print some statistics given an asynchronous result to summarize uh, timing information. Okay. Okay, why are you busy? Okay. Now I can't I can't call it yet. I can't call the the one to print parallel statistics yet. Because this guy probably still hasn't finished. Let's have a look and see where it is still. 21 out of 56. OK, maybe I should have done, maybe I should have cut even more of these out. I left. Oh, the, ah, shoot. We, I did leave all these three percentage ranges. OK, I did leave. So it's th these, all of these boundaries, but for each of these boundaries, it's evaluating at a certain percentage of matching. And I have three percentages of matching. So the, the total list is the, the cross product of all of these at percentage, uh, at percentage 76, at 98%, and at 3% matching. This is a parameter of this algorithm. I don't know exactly what it measures. It's, it's a level, it's a level of, of match. Uh, in the trees, but it's doing all of these, it's checking all of these 
different pieces of the sequences. But for, so I defined seven regions, but these seven regions are being done for all three. And now, why is it? What's that? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it's a list between 76 and 98. Yes, which means it's a list of base. It's all of these values. Okay, so the eight of them is 56. And uh, that's what I should have, uh, I forgot to change also that one. So I, I cut out a lot of regions from the analysis, but I forgot, I forgot to, to, make, uh, to make this significantly shorter. And let's see where it is. Yeah. Hmm, we found a bug. I was going to cancel them and restart it, and async map results has no attribute client. Okay. So this is a bug that I need to file and we need to fix that the abort call is the abort call is failing. Okay, we need a we need a test for that and we need a bug for that. Paul, can you report that one? <laughs> Thanks. Min Min will have it fixed by the end of by the end of this by the end of the stock. Okay. Well, actually, I know how to do it. No. Yep. No, but, but you'll be able to re-log in. We'll all have to reel in. What's that? <clears throat> Here, let me show you the trace back. Calling dot abort on an async result results in, in an attribute error, line, line 198 of, put it in a gist so you can copy and paste the trace back. Two, three, four, seventy-one, eighty-two. What's that? Real communication between two interfaces. <laughs> yep. So let's see. It's almost ready. Now it's setting up uh, passwordless SSH. So now you see it's not that bad to restart it. It's actually not that bad. Because once it gets going, these parts are reasonably quick. The, what I've noticed is the, very, the initial, sometimes it takes a while just to start at all. And that's when the instance hasn't been moved over to the kind of accessible disks. When it was terminated long ago and they flushed it out, then they, Amazon has to copy it out from the kind of the long-term S3 storage into the usable storage. And that's the step that sometimes takes quite a while. Like you're, you're waiting for five minutes and nothing happens. This, once it gets going, this part is typically a couple of minutes. Um, it's that initial part 
that can take uh, five minutes or ten minutes or so. There we go. See, the total was uh, two minutes, 2.6 minutes, so I wasn't too bad. And did we get the same URL or not? Um, 5017, 17270. 5017, 17270. Nice, we even got the same URL. Okay. So, but I do have to re log in. And so will you. So I Python dash demo dash twenty twelve. Log in. I open this guy. So I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna run this. Because they're running fairly slowly, I'm, I'm gonna remove And the, those base percentages. Mm, no, make it a lower value, just that. So now we have a total of six tasks instead of six instead of 56. So it shouldn't be too bad. I mean, I know they weren't exactly screaming, but six will finish much, much quicker than 56. And we should have been able to abort it, but obviously we just found a bug in IPython, so we need to fix that. Yeah, the abort wasn't. I mean, it's kind of a brutal way to do it, obviously. And <clears throat> and I, I could have gone and, and, and stopped the processes manually and whatnot, but I just figured rather than because Star Cluster lets you SSH into into the, the, the node yourself, and so you can go in and type IP cluster stop and re-add the engines. And uh, so I, if I had done that, I wouldn't have had to completely reboot. I could just stop the engine processes and restart them again by typing the IPython cluster commands myself. Because if you do this, star cluster um, SSH master, uh, and the name of the instance, there you go. You're SSH'd in. That's it. You've SSH'd into the cluster, right? So you can run top and see who's doing what. You can SSH into one of the instances and see who's spending time. So now you can SSH into node 001, for example. Um, oh, not as root. I have to SSH in as as user. That's you. Why is that not working from here? Anyway, I thought I thought I could SSH into all the nodes in this way. Um, but at least I can SSH into the master node and uh, and kill the commands from there. Hmm. I'll have to ask why, Justin, why it's not working because I thought you could once you'd SSH into the master node, I thought it set up so that you could SSH into any of the nodes, any of the instance nodes uh, directly from the master node. And I don't know why I don't know why that's not working. Okay, so it's done. In this case, it took a little over a minute, and it finished all, all six tasks in over a minute. And this was the slowest part. So now, now this is the output with the, the partial alignments. And here we can print. So this little utility gives you some statistics of the time. And we can see here that the time was dominated by one task that took the longest time. And, uh, but in total, uh, we basically waited 
just 66 seconds. And we can see that the longest task was 66 seconds. So one engine ended up stuck with that, but at least all the others got done in the meantime. Uh, and so the, we only had to wait as long as the longest task took, and the other engines took care of flushing the rest of the tasks. And this is, this is why you want to use load balancing, right? Because you want, you want your engines, if one, when, when the distribution of times between your jobs is, is uh, uneven, you want to be using, you want somebody to keep feeding jobs to the ones that become available as they become available. So now, the next, this is to show that often, in this case, the next step in the process is actually a Python script. So obviously in the cluster, we could have used it as a library and used the Python API for that library. But we're actually calling it as a subprocess because it's very common to do this kind of thing. It's very common to have an analysis pipeline where some intermediate step is a command line call that you have to make to another process, right? And so here, we're calling, we're writing as a function something that takes a file name and calls the next step of the process with certain parameters. The parameters, what they are, doesn't matter a whole lot. Uses subprocess to call it and then returns the, the name of the output. And so in this case, this one we're actually going to type, we called it with map sync. This one doesn't take almost any time at all. So I called it with map sync, and it took a total of 1.6 seconds. And that's it. It finished. I actually called it with percent time, so IPython would, will give us timing statistics. And so all we have to do is define this part of the script as a function. And that's it. You call map sync. You give it the, the names of the <coughs> this sub lines was the name of the outputs that we got from the previous one. So we got this right here. So this is how, when you have one of these asynchronous results, which as I said is a promise on something that will be computed and may finish later, when you want the actual result, you have to call dot get on it. And this waits and gives you the actual data. So the AMR object itself isn't the the, the, what you asked to be computed. This is a proxy that has some information about the computation being done somewhere else. And with dot get, it waits for completion and gives you the actual value. Okay, And you can call dot get with a timeout in case you don't want to wait forever. You can say dot get with a timeout of one second. And if it doesn't, it, if it, it waits for at most a second. If you simply say dot get, it just waits until the actual answer comes back. And then you have the value. So we got, we got the, the output of the, sec of the previous step. We feed it into the next step. Uh, now we have to build all these trees. So this is, again, another function that actually will take some time. And in this case, it's another function using these libraries that aligns all of these different trees, takes some file, files as arguments, calls routines. Specifically, what this is doing doesn't matter too much. The point is, you're seeing sort of how to structure a long analysis pipeline, break it into chunks, make those chunks into functions. And once you've made them into functions, where you can say what are the, that the arguments of one can be used to feed into the next, then the actual execution in parallel is pretty straightforward because this is all it takes. It's calling various versions of map sync, map async, with either a direct execution view or a load balanced execution view. And with these little utilities that we built, you can print statistics. So let me execute. And you can queue up. So IPython shows in here. This star right here means that it, this cell is, being ex is executing. And so that IPython is busy waiting because it's executing this cell. This is right now on the notebook, on the node running the notebook. Right? This is the kernel. The kernel for this notebook is the one that's busy. Uh, in this case, simply busy waiting. But you can queue up multiple cells. So I, I hit Shift Enter also on this one. So now this cell is also queued for execution. And once the previous one finishes, then this one will finish as well. And I, the same thing, I can queue this cell for execution. And then you can keep on queuing cells for execution. And then they will, they will just get, uh, um, get completed. Now, in this case, we're building a matrix of distances. So we're getting a bunch of trees, and we need to build all the pairwise distances. So this is an object. This is a function. Imagine you have to build a bunch of pairwise matrices, and you want to do that in parallel. And then one way to do that is to have each node have information about part of that matrix. 
and compute it in, into a matrix that has zeros in it. And as long as they're not overlapping, you can then add all of those matrices back at the end, and that'll be a very quick step. OK, so here, this finished. And we had to wait a total of roughly 135 seconds. And that was actually how much the longest task took. In fact, there's a slight discrepancy in the clocks uh, in where it actually thinks that the longest task took 135 seconds, but that the client actually only took 134 to wait. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why there should be any discrepancies in those clocks. It may be just a little bit of rounding, because there is no way, no way that we can, we can get a task in less time than it took for the longest one of them to actually complete. Now, once we do this, once we define this function that basically initializes at zeros, that initializes at zeros, then here we, we call the comparison function. And the way in which now we com compute the full function, the full matrix, is this. So this is a very elegant trick. If you see here, AMR is the async result, which was the output of, the output of uh, running the comparison function of all, over all the trees. And we've written a simple function called pr that does a summation of the two matrices. And in this case, actually prints progress as it does it. And this is how you can add. This is a very elegant trick. Python has a function called reduce. The Python function reduce takes a function and a sequence of arguments and begins calling that function with the first two and then the next, the output of that and the next, and the output of that and the next, and the output of that and the next. So if you call the function a plus b on a list, it sums all that list, right? Because it adds the two, the first two, and then the output of that with the next, and the output of that with the next. Well, it turns out that asynchronous result objects can be looped over as a list. And they can actually be looped over while the results are being computed. So by writing this code right here, we're calling the sum function, which actually prints as it's, as it's doing it, and letting it add these matrices as they come back from the nodes. And so we're actually looping over the output of the parallel computation and aggregating the output of the parallel computation as the nodes compute the output and stacking these matrices over to, to get the combined matrix. And now we can see, we can actually look at, at this combined matrix. In this case, because we had such few tasks, the results are probably not terribly interesting. And now the final step was to call a couple of just, just a couple of command line calls for the visualization plot for visualizing the final result, OK? So since I don't really know about the biology, and that's not what really matters to us here, I'm not going, these last two steps don't take any extra, they don't take too much time. And this one simply generates, um, generates a file that has to be opened with a, uh, oh, I don't actually know what was wrong in it. Um, but it's supposed to generate a file that is uh, loaded with a Java viewer. Um, that, that, I, that actually doesn't run on my machine. So the point is, at the end, this was just a local step. IPython lets you pass command line calls. In the notebook, if, if you start with exclamation, anything that you put after that goes to the command line, which means that if you need to call system utilities in, in, your, in the cluster, you don't have to SSH through a separate terminal. You can do it all within the same node environment. So this is actually the complete analysis that we ran. And as I said, the, the final, the, the full-blown thing, which we started on, I think, 30-some nodes, uh, ran in 24-plus hours an analysis that took about a month's worth of CPU time. And this, is, this was the real code. It really is not very hard. So hopefully, seeing a real example in action will make the tutorial materials a little bit more understandable. We have on the IPython, because now I want to switch over to Paul to talk about GPUs um, here. If you go to ipython.org, we have extensive documentation and we have videos. And there's a video of whenever the. 
So the third, vi the third video that we, ha we have a bunch of them, but the third one is a long three-hour tutorial uh, on all of using IPython. The first hour is the general part of IPython. The second hour is the notebook. And the third hour is the parallel machinery in low-level detail. So rather than going over that here, I wanted to show you guys an integrated example. And that material, you guys can view it there. And in our documentation, all of these, the tutorial notebooks, uh, the, our documentation has an explanation of these APIs. And I will put on BSpace the notebooks for that tutorial. So that if you actually want to get the low level parts, and needless to say, ask us. But as, uh, as hopefully you saw here, this is running a real world example. And it, it isn't that hard. The moment, if you can basically, the, the, the take home message is, if you can break it up into functions, you can parallelize it very easily with IPython. Number two, you should use it. IPython is not good at transferring large amounts of data between your nodes. Okay, that is an important point to keep in mind, which is that if you try to use it, when, you, when I use that syntax with the, with the brackets to send and retrieve stuff, it doesn't matter what you put in there. But if you start putting gigs of data in there, you will kill the performance of the system. The, trans, the data transfer facilities are meant for the transmission of small amounts of, th of information, the values of parameters, the names of files, things like that. If you need to trans move a large amount of data between your nodes, you're better off using a shared file system or using something like MPI, which is optimized for high-speed transfer of low-level objects. We do have optimized the transfer of pure NumPy arrays to be as fast as we can make it. But still, the f in general, the flow that you want to keep in mind is you break up your problems, you use IPython to do the orchestration and the transfer of parameters, and then you let the engines do the heavy, the heavy lifting. But don't try to use it to distribute large amounts of data between engines, because that will be very slow. OK? Any other que any questions? Is it easy to have all the nodes be a single direct, uh, like to all of them agree on what some direct? So they already are. Not only is it easy with, I, with Star Cluster, it's trivial. They are all. Seeing so, let's as a quick exercise before I shut down. Let's. How would we do that in here? So I'm going to write a function that does, ls right. So if I say import os os dot list. There. That gives me, a listing of the of the local of the local files. Okay, so if I say. Sorted. List there, and I look at the first, say, four. OK, these are the first four files in this directory, right? So now I want to run this on all my nodes to see if they all. So I'm going to say, oh, I make this a function. And that's it. And now I'm going to make a direct view, which is a view of, uh, for direct execution. And I say direct view dot uh, map. And I'm going to make it synchronously because I don't care. ls um, oops, what did I do wrong? Oh, yes, no, because I don't need to. Um, there's a decorator for that. If I want to run, yes. Um, I'm sorry? All of your other uh, parallel code uses view and not this. Oh, the other one was a load balance view. Okay. The other one was, and in this case, I'm just going to use a direct view because I'm going to send it to all the engines. Okay. okay? So, <clears throat> so here, I'm, I'm calling this function ls over the range. Uh, this is a slightly hackish way to do it. I need to actually give me a second and I'll look up, I'll look up while 
um, Paul sets up, I'll look up a slightly cleaner solution than this. But um, I'm calling LS over the range, uh, range of the length of all my engines so that it goes one to each engine. And then you can see that all of them report in LS the exact same files. So they're all seeing the exact same file system. Uh, and that's courtesy of star cluster. Part of, the, part of the startup that we saw here was this. Star cluster actually configured NFS for us and made sure that all of the, all of the, all of the engines and the master node were all configured as part of the same NFS environment so that they all see the same file system. And if you had volumes, EBS volumes mounted, they would also be exported, mounted on the master, and exported over NFS to the clients. So all you have to say is, this is my EBS volume with my data set, make it available, and Star Cluster does all, every, all the configuration for you. So it's a fair amount of Unix sysadmin rolled up in one, in one single command. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, so while Paul sets up, I'm going, to, I'm going to look up a syntax for a slightly cleaner solution to that last one. I'll just pull it out. I don't need it, but you can just pull it out. So that's not in your way. <coughs> Do you need the pointer? Uh, I don't think I will, but you can, sure. You can, you can have it if you want to. Thank you. Mic. The mic. The mic. Yes. Good catch. I'm not going to say anything of value anyways. Here you go. If he was at home to judge the Oh, that's right. For posterity, right? Also, might be good to have a recording of where you're saying that for that note, you know, mumbling under his breath of what he's saying. Zing. Zing. I thought I was harsh to Fernando. Um, all right, hey guys, <laughs> give me a sec to set up. Um, I have this somewhere. This doesn't always work the way I want it to the first time. Um, well, okay. If you say so. Yeah, sure. So, so as soon as I press the button, it doesn't work. All right, so hey guys, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, GPU programming. Um, this will be a high-level talk, so I 
gave uh, a talk on this in the last time Josh taught this class, which was um, last fall. 2010, actually. 2010. Fall of 2010. Fall of 2010, that's right. Um, and it was presented on November 1st, so it has a little bit of a Halloween-y theme. Um, and I decided to sort of, um, last time I had an hour and a half, and I actually thought that I did a bad job doing some of the early things, high-level things, and I expanded that. And I tried to shorten the, the end, um, but I don't think I shortened enough of it. So we may not get through all of it, but sort of the high-level things will be there. Um, I'm mostly just a user of this technology. This isn't something that I'm sort of doing active research on. And, and I want to make this sort of a folksy overview so that you can actually walk away with an idea of, of GPU programming um, in your head of what that is. And then once you dive into the details, then you'll sort of learn, uh, learn the details. I do say that you know, GPU programming from Python, and there's literally just one slide with Python code on it. So sort of, and we might not even get to that. So that's uh, the, um, the from Python portion, sort of parenthetical. Uh, OK, so like I said, it'll be a, a Halloween-y theme. So um, uh, by way of analogy, talking about uh, GPUs and solving some computational problem, we're going to talk about uh, having a candy eating contest. And so who do you think would uh, win in an uh, eating contest? Uh, let me do this so that I can stop. Uh, all right, I guess I'll just live with it twice. Who would win in a candy eating contest? Would it be Fat Bastard versus a toddler? Um, so this happens to be my daughter uh, on Halloween. And so, of course, one toddler versus Fat Bastard isn't really a fair contest, right? Fat Bastard would just eat everything way quicker than a toddler. But uh, just to be sort of fair to the youth of tomorrow, what if we had a bunch of kids? And so, um, so here I'm showing a handful of kids. But really, you can think of, um, uh, and this will sort of translate to the GPU world, you can think of this as a uh, fat bastard having to compete with a whole school of kids. Okay? So uh, things get a little bit more interesting. And so who would win then? Any takers? The kids? Well, actually, it's a sort of a trick question. It depends. It depends on just how much candy there is to eat, right? Because if it's sort of just one bucket full of candy, the kids will spend their time sort of trying to divvy it up, and it'll take them an hour before they settle on how much is fair to have for each kid, right? You have a communication problem, whereas Fat Bastard would just load it all in and just sort of munch away, right? Uh, but if it's a full truckload of, of candy, um, then Fat Bastard sort of doesn't have a chance, right? The kids were, once they're, so, so, so long as they're sort of organized in their approach, they distribute all the work, they distribute it, you know, maybe crates full of candy to this group of kids and another crate full of candy to another group of kids. What happens is that they're, they're munching away. So any given kid is not eating faster than Fat Bastard, right? I mean, that's just, you can't compete with Fat Bastard. But sort of... Say it again? <laughs> Fat bastard can eat the kids. Yes, I didn't stretch the analogy that far, but um, these aren't babies we're talking about. These are sort of toddlers. Uh, you know, he was talking about babies getting in his belly, so I think the toddlers are safe, and the, the toddlers are pretty fierce. So uh, this, this sort of analogy, as, uh, as I said, sort of applies. Fat bastard is the CPU in a way. And, and uh, you can think of the GPU as a whole school of toddlers, uh, uh, sort of ready to eat your candy. Uh, but they're, remember, they're not full-grown adults, right? They're a little bit less sophisticated, a little bit more naive. Um, uh, they're not as fast, so the GPU clock speeds aren't as high as CPU clock speeds. Um, but uh, so their power is in numbers. Um, and they do need supervision, and they need to be directed. And they really work best in unison, sort of if they're all doing the same thing, the teacher tells them, you know, now we chew, chew, chew. You know, they can do that. Um, anything outside of that, uh, then that's where you start to sort of lose your performance. If every, if every kid is doing their own activity, they're not actually going to get things done faster than Fat Bastard. OK. Um, so why, why, uh, why am I talking about GPUs? Well, GPUs uh, can take over the paralyz uh, parallelizable portions of your code and do them efficiently. 
So you don't get to beat Amdahl's law, as, as sort of Fernando talked about previously, but provided that you have enough parallelism in your code that can be uh, taken advantage of, uh, what we're seeing here is a plot of uh, uh, two, two of the graphics card uh, vendors and the, uh, the, the number of floating point operations, 32-bit uh, precision uh, floating point operations that they're able to do um, uh, over time. And, and here's, uh, the slide is a little bit outdated, but, but here's the, the, the CPU world, right? So even though the CPU clock speed, each individual CPU is running way faster than the GPU, because there are so many GPU sort of compute units working together, they're able to, their, their total throughput is much greater than um, CPU throughput. And this, this, this trend uh, continues, and uh, uh, there's further sort of multi coreization of the CPUs, right? You know, you, you have quad cores, you have, you have eight cores, you have 16 cores uh, in, on the CPU side as well. So this sort of, this problem uh, con uh, continues to grow, um, or rather it, uh, it continues to be the case that in order to get more work done, you just have to do more in parallel, or that's that's the only place to get the speed ups because of the rocket nozzle sort of heat issues that Fernando talked about. Let me get my time here. So, um, okay. So the. Um, the sort of as an overview of uh, GPU computing again, the uh, the CPUs make a single program sort of run very fast. Um, they there's a lot of uh, architecture in place on the CPU to bridge the gap between the super ultra fast CPU doing the actual computation and the relatively the sort of several orders of magnitude slower uh, memory that uh, uh, that where your, the, the things that you want to do in your program resides, and the even several orders of magnitude slower hard disk where maybe your data lives on, sort of to bridging, bridging that whole gap, a lot of, uh, that's where a lot of architecture uh, and a lot of sort of iron is dedicated on the CPU to making that particular um, set of problems run fast. On the CPU side, what matters is the, the throughput. Not a single thread, but if you have thousands of threads running in parallel, sort of in lockstep, and working each on a slightly different subset of the uh, problem that you're interested in, that's, that's sort of the strength of uh, GPU computing. Um, so it's, it's about how much time it takes to do the, the, all of the work, not how much it, time it takes to do a single sort of work unit um, of work. And so, uh, so the CPU style cores are uh, laid out uh, something like this. And so remember, CPUs like Fat Bastard, um, you m might not think of this uh, um, adjectives as applying to Fat Bastard, but they're sophisticated, right? They're they're complex. They're um, there's you, you know you have you have fancy br uh, branch predictions. You have uh, lots of uh, core d dedicated to caching things so that when you need to look them up again or, or to prefetching things that you might in the future use, sort of a lot of guesswork, a lot of magic that happens that the programmer doesn't need, end up needing to care about. Um, but the kids are more simple-minded, so we're sort of going to strip away um, this side. Um, oh, and I should, I should mention, uh, you're seeing uh, uh, slide credits here. This is sort of a Frankenstein of a bunch of uh, talks from, from different people, uh, mostly from Andreas Klockner who's kind enough to give me his slides. He is the lead author, uh, uh, lead developer of uh, PyCUDA and PyOpenCL, uh, both Python wrappers for CUDA um, and OpenCL. So uh, slimming down uh, one of these cores, uh, we're going to get rid of, uh, of a lot of these sort of what I've called the sophisticated components and uh, just make one thing um, run fast. And we're, then we're just going to replicate. We're going to make two of them and then four and stop at eight or 16, rather, because I doubled uh, twice. So we have 16 independent instruction streams, and, um, um, but in reality, they're not really independent. But uh, furthermore, um, you can think of one of these guys, one, after I do the next slide, you can think of this as being sort of one classroom. So each classroom and each ALU is a kid in the classroom. So this is sort of, there are eight kids to a class here, and. Um, it's an awesome student-teacher ratio, 
and each kid has a, his own little context, which is his desk, the place where he's going to sit, the, the things that he's going to do. And they're actually, since they're all in the same classroom, they're going to have some shared context. There's going to be some things that, that, that are available to all of them. They're going to be able to look around in the room. Uh, they're going to be able to hear the teacher sort of broadcast things to them. And they're going to be able to, to, to talk amongst themselves and to, uh, to synchronize and to do things. Um, uh, and here, uh, the little uh, uh, word that, uh, or the little acronym is uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. So the idea is, is that the teacher can give them, all the kids, one instruction, the same instruction, but because the, each kid has his own sort of datum that he's working with, uh, lots of work will, ha will happen in parallel. So single instruction, multiple data. Um, so we have multiple ALUs, but only sort of one, one set of things that, that uh, get the instructions. So then uh, zooming this back out into our view uh, of, of our full school. So we have school, and we have 16 classrooms here. And each classroom has eight kids. So um, really, we have 128 kids at the school, uh, 128 things happening in parallel. 16 independent groups, so those are sort of the classrooms, each with uh, eight uh, synchronized streams, each with eight um, kids in there. And which is great that these kids can do some serious eating so long as they're all doing the same thing. Um, and so what happens on the GPU when they don't do the same thing? Well, um, remember the kids uh, work best in unison, right? So if if they're not doing the same thing, then we have divergent streams. And basically, we still only have one teacher telling everybody what to do. So uh, let me show that example. Oh, that's not coming out very well here. All right, well, this is, this is some code that's, uh, that's not showing up. But there's, uh, uh, there's an if statement. And it says, if x is less than 0, do something else, uh, do something else part. And so. Uh, Suppose that uh, x is greater than 0 is sort of my apologies for this is Berkeley, and I'm briefly going to perpetuate the gender binary. But the teacher wants to do something based on sort of the presence of the x chromosome. So uh, if x is greater than 0, maybe that'll be the girl. So there's three girls in the class, and they're going to do something. Otherwise, uh, the boys are going to wait. They're not going to do anything while the girls are doing whatever it is that they were instructed to do. And then when the girls are done, then the teacher will switch to the boys and say, OK, now, boys, it's your turn to do something else. And the boys will do something. So this is, this is how branching works on the GPU, because you have there's so much sort of upfront investment in everybody doing the same thing that when they're not doing the same thing, it is. It is. Yeah. Yikes. Wow. This is, this is some heavy bass that's uh, intruding into my talk here. I'm frightened. Uh, suppose, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm scared. OK, it stopped. Good. Whew. Um, all right, so uh, then the boys went. And so, uh, but we still have some problems here, right? All the things that we've gotten rid of that, that exist on the CPU side uh, but don't on the GPU side were there for a reason. Uh, they were there to bridge the latency gap between the ultra fast ALUs and the pretty slow random me memory access. That's what sort of caches are for. Uh, they were there. Uh, uh, there's some fancy branch prediction. Sort of uh, uh, the CPU tries to be clairvoyant and, and a, sort of a precog and guess into the future about what the outcome of some computation is going to be, and then continue uh, sort of start doing the things that it would have done had that thing happened. And then it has the ability to like drop all that work that it did if if the the, the sort of the pivot that it rested upon happening didn't end up happening. Then it sort of can drop that work. Or if it did end up happening, then it's already halfway done to getting all the, all the following things done. And then um, sort of out of order of execution, the same thing. The CPU can reorder independent steps while maybe it's waiting for memory or, or waiting for, for, for things to happen. So how can we get around this problem? Well, we can stretch our kids analogy even further. Um, and so uh, the idea is that even more parallelism and some extra memory will get a solution. Um, so in, here, we, we, as we described it, our classroom uh, had sort of just one set of desks. But suppose uh, we had several sets of desks within a classroom. 
And so the, the, the desks will sort of define what sort of activity we're going uh, we're gonna to use. So maybe one will be for uh, our, our desks where we eat our candy, and two will be where we do maybe some painting, and uh, three is where we go when we do singing. Um, and so, so each of these contexts is sort of a, a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, well, sorry, each of this, these sets of desks is a context for, um, for a particular kind of activity that we're going to do. And what's going to happen is, um, is uh, like I said, because we haven't gotten rid of, uh, oh, because we have gotten rid of these prefetch units and a lot of the cache, although I should say that sort of the newest generation GPU cards are becoming more CPU-like, so they are getting some cache uh, in there. But uh, sort of in the older generation and, the, and in the general case, they don't have cache. So here we're task one. We're at desk, uh, set of desk number one. So we're eating our candy. Um, and, and that's all fine and well. But then once we finish our candy, uh, we're, we're, we're stalled. We, we, can, we ate all the candy that we had. right? The, uh, all our kids ate the candy. And we've called in the next crate of candy. But that, it's going to take a while before it comes over from the truck. right? It's going to take a while before it chips in. So we're stalled. And, and what are we going to do? Well, we're going to keep ourselves busy uh, uh, while we wait for the candy to come in. We're going to switch to our second sort of set of desks and our second set of tasks that we have running concurrently. Um, and uh, we're going to switch to painting. Um, right? We're going to do some painting. Um, and at some point, we're going to you know, maybe finish painting a, a painting. And now we have to wait for it to dry, or we have to wait for, you know, for more paint to come in. Maybe we've run a paint. And so we're going to. Uh, our task number one is stalled, so we're waiting on candy. We just completed some painting, but we're, maybe we ran out of paint, so we've, we've ordered the office to bring us more paint, and so we're going to stall here and keep going. Eventually, so long as we have enough activities to go, so this is time going downwards, so long as we have activities, eventually we'll get back uh, uh, to a point where we can resume our candy eating, right? Eventually, a crate will come in, and we'll be ready to eat again, and we can switch to that activity. So provided that we have enough of these activities that we can interleave, then we can always stay busy. Our kids can always be doing something. And sort of because there are so many of them, again, we're going to get a lot more work done. Um, and so we'll, while waiting for our uh, drawings to dry, maybe we'll do some singing here and you know, I don't know, jump around and uh, get some energy out here. OK, so um, I think I've said this. So and uh, yeah, eventually, I mean, we will finish everything. Um, but it, 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 will, it will appear as though you know, we worked. So the total time that it took us to complete this one task is, is sort of great. But by the end, as we start finishing things up, uh, we'll, um, we'll compensate for it by doing many, many things at the same time and sort of waiting in between. Uh, while we're waiting on memory to arrive. Uh, so the core ideas uh, um, in GPU architecture is that we have many uh, slimmed down cores. So there's, there's lots of parallelism. There's um, uh, more ALUs and fewer control units. And the way that we avoid memory stall is by interleaving execution of these single instruction multiple data groups. So it's the teacher telling everyone what to do and, and sort of when the teacher senses that oh, we're out of we're out of candy, then we're going to switch switch activities and do something else. But but um, sort of importantly, we needed to have exposed enough act uh, enough uh, tasks that we wanted the kids to do in the first place, right? So so long as we have enough to do, then um, we can sort of keep the kids uh, busy um, in this manner. Okay, so so here's here's another way of uh, sort of visualizing what's going on here, um, um, and, and again, so this is the uh, on the CPU side, the, this is the portion of the die that's sort of doing the arithmetic for us, and then you know you see uh, uh, the the control units fairly sophisticated, and there's a lot of die uh, dedicated to cache. On the GPU side, you have a lot more of these compute units that are in green. The ALUs and the, the the control units and the and the cache, if any, is sort of very small. Okay, and and here's a real picture, uh, also sort of dated, but uh, um, 
this uh, particular CPU can do uh, four single precision operations at a time, whereas uh, uh, this uh, AMD GPU, because it has all these SIMD cores, um, it can do 800 single precision floating point operations uh, at a time. And so, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of the die is dedicated to cache. There's uh, data cache, instruction cache, a level two cache, and very, um, the, uh, this is sort of where the, the floating point in the SIMD portion of the die is, whereas the, the bulk of the, the die is um, dedicated to compute on the GPU. So there's, there's sort of some, some benefits and some um, disadvantages to, to using GPUs. The benefits are is the, the memory bandwidth. So you, you can have actually a lot of um, um, parallel access to memory is efficient. Because again, remember that when, um, when sort of a teacher calls in a particular set of memory, that memory becomes available to all kids. So they can, they can all share amongst each other um, uh, a lot of the memory. And the, the, the way that the cards were manufactured was in a way to, to make memory access efficiently. Um, um, the, they, they can do compute, uh, the, sort of the, the throughput, the compute throughput is greater. But there are some losses. You, know, you, know, you don't get anything for free. So um, in particular, uh, one thing to note is that uh, there's no performance portability. What that means to me is that uh, what's optimal on your card may not be optimal on my card. So really, a lot of these optimizations that you end up doing, they may be sort of card specific. The general trends will be there, but, but for, your speci for a specific configuration of a card, and um, it'll, it'll be sort of less efficient than, than another, uh, maybe a next generation card will do something that used to be inefficient will be way more efficient. Something that used to be the most efficient way um, may not be the most efficient anymore. Um, then the data size also can affect sort of the algorithm design and, and vice versa. There's this trade-off because you really, you end up, uh, one of the things that we gave up uh, that in a few earlier slides is that we end up coding sort of at the low level. We end up synchronizing our, our the, the threads that within our classroom together, we end up writing exactly what memory gets fetched and when and where that gets stored. And we also have to keep track of how much, mem how much totally memory is available locally. So you end up, when you do GPU programming, you can get sort of an order of uh, sort of uh, like a 10 times improvement sort of trivially uh, for, for many applications just by doing, you know, doing the same thing in parallel. Um, but to really gain the, the 50 to 100 to 200 times speed up, you end up having to know a lot about the, arch the specific architecture that you're targeting and how the memory is laid out and what its limitations are. Um, and I'm saying this not to sort of, not to sort of scare you, but to make you aware of what, wh where it is that you end up having to spend a lot of the time. But there are solutions. And the solutions is because these things end up getting so complex, you end up just sort of trying everything. You end up trying to write your, um, write your algorithm and maybe a specific block size that's not hard-coded, but that, that you're going to vary as a parameter. And a specific sort of memory layout that's not hard-coded, but that will also be sort of pluggable. And that's, that's the power that sort of as, um, as we get to the tail end, to the Python side of it, that's where that will come in. Um, Okay. Um, so um, OpenCL is this open computing language. Uh, there's uh, sort of the predecessor to it is NVIDIA's CUDA. Um, uh, open, uh, NVIDIA's CUDA is an NVIDIA-specific uh, 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 general purpose GPU programming language, whereas OpenCL is a consortium of, of uh, many um, companies, including NVIDIA. And so um, OpenCL is sort of the, 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 the new kid on the block, but it is the, the more widely supported kid because NVIDIA in all of their cards supports OpenCL, but OpenCL is also supported by the AMD cards, and there's also um, CPU backends for OpenCL. Um, and what it is, OpenCL defines the uh, programming interface, a library that you're going to use to write your code. 
and the device side programming language that's going to that's going to sort of implement the specifics that the library is going to expose. And it comes with uh, what I started to allude to, this real-time code generation um, uh, RTCG uh, aspect, where you're going to be able to define your problem in such a way that you, because you don't know exactly which architecture you're targeting, or because you want to squeeze the most performance out of the specific architecture, you're going to try lots of different things and benchmark them and see which one comes out the fastest for you for the particular sort of card that you're on. And so uh, this is just sort of a, sl a, a open CL slide just to sort of convince you that um, a lot of the big names are um, behind this, that this isn't just a, sort of a, a thing that's going away. And it's, uh, it's uh, put together by the, uh, the Kronos group as sort of the, organ the organizers and keepers of the open CL standard. And they're also the ones that maintain the open GL standard, uh, uh, the web GL standard, among others. Um, so the, the, the execution model is that um, for, for OpenCL is that we're gonna, our items are gonna be sort of like the things that get taken care of by individual ALU, by an individual students. The work group is the thing that gets taken care of by an individual classroom. And then multiple work groups uh, will, will be laid out in sort of a grid where you have lots of uh, data. You can think of the grid as the, the total number of sort of the truck's worth of candy that you have to eat. And that gets mapped out to uh, different classrooms. Um, and the, the CUDA words for this are similar, where um, um, instead of uh, a, an item, this would be like a thread uh, running uh, within some thread block, uh, which is the work group. And uh, the, the word for grid is uh, the same. Um, so the, yeah, the grid is all the work that we have to do for a particular um, activity. Um, so this is just. Going back to, to what we've done here, so we, we have our ALUs. They have some context, uh, some of it which is shared, some of which which is private. This is sort of their own work desks. Um, and while we're waiting for memory, we're gonna uh, we're gonna work on something else. And when that uh, so this is this is one classroom, and we have multiple class, classrooms. Uh, do we actually end up caring about how many uh, cores that we have? Do we care about how many classrooms that we have? It, ends, it turns out that when we define how it is, what it means to work on our problem, all we need to do is define how it is that a particular classroom is going to solve the problem. And then whichever classroom gets it, however many classrooms it is that we have available, that's how many are going to work on it. So uh, who cares how many cores we have? We're going to program as if we have infinitely many cores and program as if there are infinitely many uh, ALUs because you know, if we have four classrooms, they'll do the same thing, but just 40 classrooms will, will finish faster. And you can think about, you know, what's, what's easier to do? Is it easier to program, uh, take a parallel program and run it on sequential hardware, which is sort of like, oh, bummer, you're not going to get, you know, any, anything good out of your parallel program. You're not going to be able to squeeze any parallelism out. Uh, or oh, what's, uh, is it harder to take a sequential program and run it on parallel hardware? Like there, this, this just does not compute, right? This is this is a very very hard problem. Whereas this is just a, a slow way of getting the solution. So um, so back to the the software representation side of things. So this is, this will be sort of a grid of things, uh, and this is how how does it map to our classrooms? How does it map to our hardware? We're gonna. Uh, uh, in, in sort of in GPU talk, we talk about uh, having a kernel, which is something that we're going to do to the entire grid. We're going to per perform some function, uh, take some data, and, and crunch some numbers on it. And we're going to specifically, we're going to take uh, each of these work groups, this block uh, of a grid, and then we're going to map it onto one of our classrooms. And uh, so that gets mapped to that. And so these four get mapped there, and so on. And so you can see that, that if your GPU card has you know, 16 classroom equivalents, uh, and mine has you know, 50, I'll just get done faster. But all that we've had to do is program, sort of teach it how to do one of these blocks. What does it mean to do a, comp a computation on one of these blocks? Because the only synchronizations that you have are within a block. 
you don't have sort of an explicit um, um, immediate way of getting all the classrooms working together, right? You'd have to sort of have a uh, put in sort of one big block on your you, you run a kernel on on the data and you wait for the the kernel to finish on the whole grid of data before you can do some some next computation on it. And so. So maybe the, uh, uh, they, they can only sort of work a few work units at a time, and then they, uh, they're going to work through it. And uh, so, um, so really, a group provides a pool of parallelism to draw on, and the order within a group matters. So remember, uh, where's my pointer? Uh, with, within a group, it's going to matter that this item finished you know, maybe before this item. Maybe this item depends on things before it. And, we can ensure that, that that is the case because we have sort of classroom control, right? Classroom level control. But we don't, we don't have a way, when we map a problem onto, onto the full grid, we don't have a way of ensuring that this block finishes before this block. So if there's something in this block that depends on that block, this programming model doesn't expose that. And we would have to first do this block, then do that block. And if this was the case for all the blocks, then maybe you're not going to get any kind of speed up on the CPU. So if it's some iterative thing that there isn't enough computations to do in parallel to begin with, then you're not going to get a speed up. But um, so order does not matter among groups. So it could be the case that this block actually got started before this block. It's just that you, know, you can only know when they all finished. And um, that's, that's the sort of thing that you're guaranteed. That's the sort of thing that you have access to. Um, okay, so so here's here's some OpenCL code. So that, uh, because uh, so OpenCL is is effectively like CUDA, there it's an extension to the uh, C language. So it's sort of a library, and it requires some uh, boilerplate code. This happens to be four slides worth of boilerplate code. I'm just putting it up there just so you see um, sort of what it looks like, and um, and uh, and also to show you sort of what. <laughs> Uh, PyOpenCL gets you, because it gets you from these four slides, it gets you down to one slide. Um, so this is sort of setting up some memory. Um, and the actual business of this whole kernel is just right here. It's just on lines one and two, where it's going to get some data, uh, A, a pointer to a float of A, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it's going to, based on its uh, global ID, which is a way of, uh, you can think of a global ID as a way of defining a unique spot in that grid, which will be computed based on the uh, work group, sort of what classroom you're in, and where you sit within a classroom will get you your, your global ID. And uh, then you're just going to multiply whatever is there already, you're going to multiply that by two. That's, that's it for this sort of compute kernel. It's a times two um, compute kernel. It's going to go through all the data. Um, and this is how we define it, and when we actually run it is when it will map it uh, across um, a large thing, and we're going to look for some errors and make sure that we release the context and things like that. So all this boilerplate is fine. It's a little bit tedious, but you're going to say, like, do I really have to start using make files and get bogged down in C in this compiled make file? Um, no, because who are you going to call? You're going to call Andreas Klockner, who's who ain't afraid of no code, because uh, Andreas Klockner uh, wrote PyCuda and PyOpenCL, so you wouldn't have to do this. And so uh, the sort of the four pages, even though they're not that tedious, they're actually even more tedious in uh, the predecessor in CUDA, uh, the, the four boilerplate uh, uh, pages end up just being this one thing, where some of it is white space, some of it is NumPy, right? Uh, but uh, effectively, here's that same kernel um, that, um, that I highlighted. Um, and this is our multiply by two. Um, and like uh, NumEXPR, yeah, uh, like NumEXPR, the uh, code that you pass to OpenCL, uh, to PyOpenCL, rather, ends up being a string. And this is actually. A strength, this gives you uh, another entry point into, into this uh, real-time code generation. Because it's a string, we have lots of ways of manipulating strings in Python. So that if there was, you know, you have, uh, there's lots of templating uh, um, engines out there that the web guys have built to 
generate web pages really fast. And now we can generate whole sort of classes of compute kernels that try different ideas in different order and sort of to different to varying degrees uh, as templates. And we don't have to, uh, we don't have to, so I'm going to sort of speed it up, but we don't have to worry about the make file because all we do is we call build here and then that is available to us as an object that we can call that kernel on. Uh, that's what PyOpenCL gets us. So let me just sort of uh, run through these slides. So, uh, so we're going to do scripting for GPUs. Uh, scripting languages uh, like Python aren't very fast, but it turns out the CPU just takes a backseat in these in this, uh, GPU computations. It's not doing a lot of the work anyway. And so uh, and it's a lot easier to expose things as Python objects. As you all know, sort of the Python API allows you to, to provide nice, uh, nice ways of manipulating them. And then when it comes to compute, we'll let the graphics cards do its thing. Um, and I have just sort of two minutes. So PyOpenCL, as I said, is just a, it's a, it's uh, an OpenCL wrapper uh, in Python. Um, it's mature. It has, um, you don't have to write your kernels, or so this is sort of getting to the practical aspects of things. You don't have to write your own kernels. Uh, things like element-wise operations are already built for you. Random number generators are there. Um, some of the sort of more uh, traditional uh, computational objects are there from, from the GPU programming world. Um, but it does allow you, it, it exposes this really nice way of just giving, uh, being able to pass just the code that does the kernel, and then all the boilerplate is done for you and gets taken care of. Um, and sort of, um, and it does uh, integrate with NumPy. Um, said this. So it, it, it gets you out of this loop. You don't have to worry about compiling and linking. You just edit and run your code, where some of the editing, like I said, because of this templating, uh, uh, templating engine idea can happen within the program. You can actually generate many, many different instances of a compute kernel and then just run them and try them all. Um, and uh, that's this. this is what PyCuda provides for you and also happens to be what uh, PyOpenCL provides for you. Um, just, uh, so this is, this is um, uh, there's many, many slides in here about this idea of runtime code generation. I'm just going to sort of run through it um, quickly. I've sort of described this high level. This is, this is where you're in the loop, you're writing the Python code, but all the GPU codes and all this stuff, that's not interesting to you, and you'd rather just sort of butt out and let, the, let PyCuda and PyOpenCL do that for you. Um, and and it's, wor it's worth noting that if you find that GPUs work for you, Amazon offers GPU instances as well. So you don't have to go and buy a bunch of expensive GPU, GPUs to run an analysis. You can request GPU instances from Amazon as well. Yeah. If that works, if, if it turns out that it's a good fit for your problem. Yeah, and this, this auto-tuning idea isn't new. So the, the auto-tuned uh, linear algebra uh, system, Atlas, does this already. The FFTW also does this. They just generate. And if you've ever had to build Atlas on your computer, you know that this takes forever because they just try all of these different combinations just that are sp that, and to figure out which one will be optimal for your CPU. And it's the same idea. It's just that the facilities are there sort of up front for, for, and for the taking um, if you do GPU computing using either PyCUD or PyOpenCL. And so you can, you can try things um, very quickly. I'm, I'm not a sort of a sophisticated program, and I was able to get to the, to, on the order of you know, 50 to 100 times speed up on a particular problem that I was interested in, where I had been stuck just on the make and compile cycle before PyOpen, uh, PyCUDA came around. Uh, so that's sort of a testimonial. And this is what maybe what a template would look like, where the, the twice kernel will now it'll be a blocking thing, and you can uh, you can oh, excuse me. Uh, it'll be um, you'll you'll have parameters that get pa passed in as a block size and thread block size and uh, some un uh, conditional unrolling. So this is all sort of specific to Jinja uh, templating code. But this this gets when a template gets rendered and you pass it the parameters, then these things sort of, this loop gets unrolled and you'll get, you know, depending on what the block size was, you'll get that many statements and they'll have the statement specific things substituted in there. Um, 
And so you can render a template many, many times, trying out many, many different co uh, configuration. And that's just, you know, trying out the templates is now just a for loop or sets of for loops within your, um, within your Python code, right? And then, you know, that source module will be available, and now you can use it and run it. So that's, that's the last um, um, slide. And uh, last slide. And this idea, by the way, of code generation is most typically done in the context of GPUs, but you can do the same thing with CPUs. So Cypon <coughs> has a method called .inline that allows you to basically call a snippet of C++ or C or C++ right within the current function. And I've, I've done that in the past with C++. Same idea of basically generating code that is matched to the parameters of my problem and, and running it at, at creation time of my object so that I can get maximum performance while still working in Python. So <coughs> you should in general think that for performance, you should keep in mind in the back of your head the compiler, whether it's a C compiler or a GPU-oriented compiler, is another runtime tool. Uh, that you can use to generate code which is adapted to the specifics of your problem. So thanks, guys. Um, I'm just having trouble the so Paul, acknowledgement will, slide. Will you send to Chris the... Uh, yes. Okay. I'll try and get homework out. Uh,